writing. Um, uh, I married young. I married at age 20, actually, um, which is pretty young, yeah, 20. Um, and after 10 years, it didn't work out, so uh, I got a divorce, amicably, everything. Um, but I was teaching as a lecturer at the University of North Carolina in Greensboro, um, and I was doing that for two years. Um, and I was getting kind of bored. I felt like I needed to travel to kind of open myself up and become a little more expensive. Um, so I left the university and I started traveling. Um, and I gave away everything, like all the books, and got down to 15 kilos. I like this idea of being minimalistic and simplifying my life. Um, so I got the 15 kilos and went off to Korea. Anyone been to Korea? No? No. no. Um, yeah, it was quite, quite dramatic. And this is 2005. Um, I landed in Korea with my 15 kilos and um, waiting for the owner of the school to come pick me up. Uh, it was called a hogwam, which is basically a cram school. Um, and she didn't come. Maybe six hours went by. And my luggage was lost. And I thought, okay, this is, is going to be interesting. Um, and then finally, you know, she showed up, and the next day she decided to show me around Seoul. And we're walking around Seoul, and I, and I lost her in the crowd. And I didn't have a mobile phone, I didn't know my address, but I did know that there were two landmarks. There was a Walmart, everyone knows Walmart, it's that big shop, and uh, Sapporo, which is a Japanese restaurant. So I thought, okay, I'll get a taxi, I'll tell them Inchon, Sapporo, Walmart. And I thought, okay, they'll bring me to where I need to go. Um, so I jumped in the taxi, it went for about an hour, and there was Sapporo, there was Walmart. Uh, I got out, wasn't the right Walmart, wasn't the right Sapporo. And I uh, walked around, got another taxi, told them the same thing. Drove for about an hour, got out, there was Walmart, there was Sapporo, not the right place. Um, <laughs> So about 10 hours later, I realized I should go into the Walmart and ask them for the actual address in Korean that I could give to the taxi driver of the other Walmart. So finally, I, I get the, I find a guy that's cutting uh, boxes and stacking stuff and, and tell him that, you know, I want to get to the other Walmart. It took about 10 minutes of hand gesturing and that kind of thing. And then he wrote on a piece of cardboard in Korean the address for Walmart. So I got the big piece of cardboard, gave it to the taxi driver, and eventually got home. And that was kind of the beginning of these wanderings, uh, of getting lost, uh, sometimes on purpose, sometimes not. Um, so the traveling, I guess, kind of forced me to, to really focus on everyday things, simple things that you take for granted, like you know, getting a bus or buying a loaf of bread, um, especially since I didn't speak the language. So it kind of focused me more on those, those small details. Um, and also forced me to examine my own position, my own subjectivity, my own ideology, of course, um, and wrestle with identity as well. I, I grew up in Northern Ireland and left when I was 12 for the United States, obviously from my accent, you can tell, uh, to the Northwest and then North Carolina. And then at about age 20, I started wrestling with, well, what am I? My parents had become Mormon, actually, and, and that was foreign to me. And, I have an American accent, but I have a British passport, but I'm from Northern Ireland, so am I Irish, British, American? What am I? Yeah, I guess that's still the question. Um, so yeah, so I was wrestling with these ideas of identity while traveling, um, and lots of, lots of strange experiences. Um, that second week of teaching, they threw me in a room full of five-year-olds, and I was used, used to teaching university students, so Five-year-olds wasn't really my thing. I didn't know what to do. Uh, so they threw me in there, all these screaming five-year-olds. Week number two, I had my back turned to them, writing on the chalkboards, and they played a little game. They formed a little triangle with their fingers. Um, and the idea was to see how far up they could get their fingers up my bum. Um, <laughs> And it was a little bit of a shock, so I was trying to get uh, out of the way. Um, they didn't quite get it all the way up, but the guy next door uh, had the full-on experience and went running out of the classroom and never came back. He was gone. Um, then I talked to the Korean teachers later, and they said, oh, that means they really like you. <laughs> okay, cultural difference. Maybe it's a little different. I don't know about that. Um, so there were lots of experiences like that, and I was writing in notebooks, uh, thinking I was writing a book, um, but really all I was doing was re recording, um, you know, ideas, thoughts, fragments, that kind of thing. 
Um, and it took six years to finally write about uh, the Korean experience once I was in London, uh, like 2008, 2009. Um, so it took kind of some time, kind of a delayed reaction to actually kind of compose something. Um, and I made this little book called uh, Moo Dream So Window, uh, based on experiences in Korea. It came out about six months ago. And I was reading a lot of Rumi, and I was also reading a lot of um, Basho, uh, Haiku. And so it's kind of influenced by that, but kind of centered around some of these experiences as well. So I'll read just a, just a tad from that. The opening poem is called The Rumi Sequence. Dust blows in from China, and there are millions in masks. You explained some things from your childhood about kissing and rubbing. He was thick, you said, and you massaged each other in the back of his parents' van. On the way to church, you could not cry, but sometimes you whimpered. This dust is thick. You tell me it comes from the Gobi Desert. We searched for ham, but only found spam. Just hidden along like a little song. Won't you blow through me? Homeless as a fly, you lactated on my tongue. Live animals crawled in the shops. A pillow by night and a sack by day. Now my petals begin to fall. An Egyptian poet was delivered to my door, and his name was Rumi. He spoke French with Africa's nipple. Rumi and I ate fire chicken did sip soju during sang gip sal. Our owl ate the pussycat. A secret worm ate the owl. Heat came from the floors. I can take all of you into my mouth, you said. Your eyelashes were very amenable. Only for morning glories did we open the door. Lights buzzed in the night and larvae boiled on the streets. A cup of soup between our hands. Women were made to smoke in the toilets. We felt the mischief. Rainbow warriors and hermits for the royal road. Demons, ghosts, and depressions rescue the lovers from the temple door. We couldn't get out of bed except to eat Korean pizza with hot sauce. We liked to wash by way of experiment. You shaved my pubic hair to get a better grip with your mouth. The temple was dripping with rain. In the communal showers, we lost our thoughts. Don't you love your baby? Tell me, tell me true. We were wet and happy. Everybody wanted to go to Japan, but everybody should just hold hands. It was winter then. But when spring came, we plucked our eyebrows into twin hyphens. Your soft face fucked my soft thoughts. We were eating at the sushi bar. Your cock grew against my leg. I rubbed your pocket, and you came. There was a boy who talked to geese because he needed the light. Our light was like slanted rain. What is a state of thought, you said. I said, my state or yours, and you said, we can only guess. Welcome to the Korean summer, eating bulgogi and bean sprouts, small pickles and quick sushi. Home is on the highway. Memories are not the porno. Keep it neon, keep it light. We couldn't read the signs. I bought a tiltable screen. Now I can look you in the eye. So that's kind of the opening sequence to the experience uh, in Korea. Um, and it has a lot of other kind of more minimalist poems um, and more meditative poems on travel. But that was using Basho and Rumi and some other uh, lines that I stole and threw in there. Um, so after Korea, um, I went to Poland. I did two stints in Poland, um, lasting for a total of about two and a half years. Uh, the first place was a place called Katowice, southern Poland, uh, which is a kind of more industrial city. And then the second time I was in Elblong, which is a little 
little town near Gdansk in northern Poland. Um, the first time around, I ended up uh, staying in a hotel full of retired miners. I'd run out of money, things were getting pretty low, so I, I stayed in this hotel, um, and they managed to tell me it was a five-star hotel under communism. But since the fall of communism, it was no longer five-star, um, which was interesting, yeah. So the, uh, I stayed in this hotel, tried to speak to these retired miners, but I had limited uh, Polish, I still do, I should have more. But, um, and I tried to write. I tried to write while I was in that hotel, eating uh, you know, fish from cans, eating bread. Um, not because I wanted to be a cool artist or something, but because that was literally uh, what was happening at that time. Um, and I found that I could write fragments in my notebooks, but I, I was so fixated on bread, fish, uh, basic things, uh, that I ended up just recording daily details, like 7 p.m., woke up, went to the shop, bought bread, and that was an accomplishment. I bought bread, yeah, these small little things. Um, and again, wrestling with identity a little bit, and also the materiality of language itself became very apparent as uh, there was an opaqueness between you know, understanding what was being said to me and you know, being able to reply as well. Um, and, the and the desire to kind of break free from that materiality, that materiality of language um, into something more. Um, so one of my current projects is a novella called The House of Zsapka. Zsapka is a, a corner shop all over Poland. I don't know what the equivalent would be in London, but it's a, a chain shop that's all over uh, Poland. And Zsapka means little frog, so they have a little symbol of a little frog. Um, so I went in a little bit different direction um, quite recently. I'm working on this novella, and it's kind of surreal. Surreal little kind of flash stories that are interwoven with a longer narrative. Um, influenced by people like Kurt Vonnegut, which I'm sure you've heard of Kurt Vonnegut. Uh, Leonard Cohen's novels, he wrote two novels. One of them is called Beautiful Losers. Has anyone heard of that? Uh, yeah, quite, quite far out. Uh, Sam Pink, who's a bizarro writer. Tom Robbins, who's kind of an absurdist. Shane Jones, who's kind of a fabulist. And, and other people, too. Um, so it went in a little bit different direction. Um, and so an excerpt of it was published by this small press in a little chapbook thing. Um, basically, there's a lot happening in here. It's all layered on top of each other. There's a girl named Carrie, and she has a sausage dog. Uh, there's a plastic dragon. You can send a text message in a breeze fire. Uh, as a secret operation to install mesh in the groin. There's an invasion of frogs, uh, grumpy gorale, which are grumpy mountain men from Poland, from Zakopane. There's a glass lake and a village hit called Lato Lato. Uh, so it's kind of playing with fairy tale and myth as well. Um, the action happens in a place called the Forbidden Zone in Katowice, southern Poland. Um, so I'll just read a small part of this, just for the flavor maybe. Um, so Toto and the Ladybug. At the entrance to the Forbidden Zone, it says Uvaga. Ovaga means attention. There are no men around, or women, only a large plastic dragon, and a handwritten sign with some ancient symbols and a mobile phone number. Carrie texts, breathe fire. Then she types in the mobile number listed on the note and hits send. Nothing happens. She does it again, but this time she writes the text message in Polish. She is learning Polish in school. She types, Zez Ognem, I just slotted that by the way, and the dragon gives a loud snort and fire shoots straight out of its nostrils. A gate opens. The first thing her dog Toto spots is a ladybug on the tip of a sunflower. But Toto doesn't try to eat it. He licks it and licks it. The ladybug arches her back more and more. When the licking stops, the ladybug lets out a really low buzz, and it reminds Toto of the shock he got from the electric fence in the field of cows, so he keeps licking. Eventually, the ladybug lets out a sigh. The piggies are cleaning their shotguns. Carrie walks right into the forbidden zone. The trees get more and more crooked, gnarled, shall we say. And she finds a little house. The house is made of frosted flakes with a little chocolate door. And there is a wolf at the door, huffing and puffing. The wolf ignores Carrie and just keeps 
huffing and puffing. And then Carrie sees them, a family of pigs inside their house, cleaning their shotgun. She knows pigs. Yes, she helps slaughter them, but she knows them too. She separates the pigs for slaughter and the pigs for keeping. She saved one from being slaughtered because of a spider who wrote messages in its web. But that's another story. She doesn't know if the pigs will come out with the shotgun and blow away the wolf, or if the wolf will blow down the house and eat all the cornflakes and chocolate door. But she wants to watch. Fair play. Whoever wins, wins. So it goes. Creamy fish with a hint of garlic. At the border of the Forbidden Zone, there are children. They eat creamy fish with a hint of garlic. The creamy fish comes in little plastic containers, and it says, fish in creamy sauce with a hint of garlic, but in Polish. The trees are not decaying. The trees have kielbasa hanging from the branches. In the right season, say fall, they can pluck kielbasa from the branches. There are murky ponds. From time to time, a beer bottle emerges from the murky pond like a hand or a sword. But it is neither a hand nor a sword. It is a beer bottle, an empty beer bottle. And the children tan their faces with these beer bottles. They use the beer bottles because they can't afford a solarium. In their free time, they ride donkeys. They want to eat your babies. The children are slopping up cream and licking it from each other's fingers. It is the cream from the fish with a hint of garlic. The time machine disguised as a sex shop. Carrie enters the forbidden zone. She is walking her sausage dog, Toto, and eating a donut, a fresh donut, since it is National Donut Day. She is covered in pig's blood because she stayed out too late the previous evening. Carrie is big and hairy. The children can, A, try to scare her away by acting like magical elves, B, tie her up with her ropes a bit like Gulliver and tickle her nose with a feather from a large reptilian bird until she caves. C, hide. D, open the sex shop. They open the sex shop. The sex shop is painted red and it is really an extra large box. Some of the words in the window are in English, some in Polish, some in Ponglish. There are the words Konya Gapka and next to it, there is a horse in the shape of a sponge. There is the English word delight, and next to it, a long winding tube coming out of a mannequin's ear hole with blue liquid. There is the Ponglish leash hole. Next to the writing, there is a round metal object. Inside the round metal object, there is some kind of congealed fat or jelly. Anyway, keeps going on and on playing with fairy tales and layering different stories like um, What's that story about the spider making the web? Uh, Charlotte's Web. That's it, Charlotte's Web. <laughs> yeah. uh, so Charlotte's Web and uh, Vonnegut and, and different plots, actually. Instead of you know, collaging language from other places, I'm trying to take lots of plots from other places and kind of pile them on into a novella. Yeah, so lots of layers. Um, what I'm working on now is a collection of stories called Dream Window. And it's kind of memoirish and surreal flash fictions mixed together, about 260 pages in. It's influenced by the minimalism and uh, minimalism and absurdism of people like Lydia Davis, who's a recent kind of influence, uh, Tao Lin, who is a I don't know if anyone's heard of Tao Lin. He's kind of recent, um, but he does minimalist absurdist writing. Uh, Samuel Beckett, but especially Richard Brodigan, who's a Canadian writer. Not Canadian, American. Northwest, yeah, American. Incredible, incredible writer. Has anyone heard of Richard Brodigan? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. After Watermelon. Yeah. What's that? After Watermelon Sugar. Oh, yes, definitely. Yes, Watermelon Sugar is amazing. Um, so, to finish up, um, I'll just read one very short, short, short piece from there. Um, it's Christmas time in Poland. Uh, I have this little room. I'm staying with my girlfriend's parents, um, and I still don't speak enough Polish, but really kind, really nice. I get this little room in the corner at Christmas time, this is last Christmas, I have a little wooden chair, 
There was a big, huge snowman about this big with blinking lights inside and, and lots of Russian dolls all around me. So I'm sitting, it's Christmas Eve, and I'm thinking about my Polish experience coming back, uh, not living there, but coming back to visit. Um, and I'm thinking about beavers uh, as well, because um, my, my sister sent me a t-shirt for Christmas, and it said, I love beaver. And so I wore that on Christmas Eve. But um, no one got the joke. But, but beaver <laughs> is actually a small town in Utah where my sister lives. So she thought it was funny if I wore that on Christmas Eve. So I'm wearing the beaver t-shirt, looking at the snowman, uh, thinking about beavers. And I wrote this very short flash fiction. Do you like? asks beaver number one. Modic replies, he likes. They talk about the fish. The fish are in a bowl. Next to the bowl are four small cups. The cups are filled with walnut fire. The walnuts come from the family farm. The fire comes from Biedronka. Biedronka means ladybug in Polish. After the fire, they fish a fish from the glass bowl. The fish is filled with garlic. It helps the walnut fire. After five shots, the beavers switch on the telly. The telly is mounted to a wall. It is a giant telly. The telly has internet. The beavers go to YouTube. They find Gangnam Style. It is time to party. Gangnam Style is in Polish. Some of the beavers freeze their nuts. Others have no nuts to freeze. Some worship the beaver god. They break the beaver wafers and drink the beaver wine. All of the beavers work their chest. Their chests are zajebiście. Zajebiście means fucking great in Polish. The beavers are zajebiście. Marek loves the beavers. He watches the beavers and drinks the walnut fire. He chews the garlic fish. He gets a t-shirt. It is a black t-shirt. The t-shirt says, I love beaver. Thanks a lot.